Okay, it's time for the Greg's Garage Pod with co-host Jason Pridmore. I'm Greg, and yes, Jason is here. All you woeful souls, thank you so much for putting up with me last week by myself. Jason and I have probably talked for what, Jay? I don't know, an hour before we even get on this podcast? How you doing, buddy? I'm tired of you already, and I got a little bone to pick with you. All right, go for I it. I want to know last week, and and our, our tens of viewers uh, want to know why you cut me off at the end of that podcast last week when I was talking about starting my archery you career. Were, you were done. You were done talking. You were I just done. felt it was a little bit rude. That's all I'm saying. I thought it was a little uncalled for that you start the music bed over me talking about it. Really? So, How's your right yeah. wrist? Do you think you can pull a bow back with that right wrist? I think it'll fall apart. You probably, your your hand will be down range and your arm will be behind you. Listen, I could use my mm-hmm. feet. I've seen it. <laughs> I've yeah, seen no, trick shot guys. Yeah. People yeah, do no, it. No, no, not even, no, no. There's a guy, uh, yeah, no. The problem is I don't have an ankle that I can even, I don't have an ankle that I can do it with. So, yeah. But guy named Matt, Matt Stutzman. Matt Stutzman. He's been featured on like 60 Minute Sports or something like that. He's the armless archer. He actually won uh, the 2000 and sorry, Matt. It's All right. 2000 I apologize, everybody. I got him started with archery. I apologize. 17 yeah, great. USA Archery Wonderful. National title. Yeah, that's great. Anyway. And, you got a, he was, and, and he's got 17. You already got two or three, which is mind boggling to no, most of us. No, no, no. I said he won two. So. But Stutzman is he was born without arms, so he has little, as he calls them, little little nubs or little stumps. Yep. And he actually um has been asking me for two years, put him on a motorcycle he wants to ride. He has a, a friend's scooter that he gets on and rides a thing around um with That's no so arms. Cool. Yeah. That's he, rad. He's gnarly, dude. He he, you know, drives with his feet and oh yeah, he's he's good dude That's too. Good. But anyway, how was the enough. uh yeah, you know, we, we were in New Jersey this week, right? Mm-hmm. So we got to see Jeff White. I love yeah, we, me some Jeff White. Uh, he is the best. Oh, uh, Jeff White. Old rocking chair. Old rock. It, he's a beaut. Rock solid. I mean, the guy is just, he cracks me up. You got to admit. A, he, dude, he's a staple. He's a staple. He's a staple in the paddock. You know what I mean? Oh, dude. Well, yeah, yeah. Everybody's so, dude, his best friend, dude, right? Dude, I talked to Jake Lewis. You know what I mean? Jake was telling me all kinds of stuff. Well, the funny thing is, is that Jeff White will ask questions apparently I'm not willing to ask. So he'll come back and give me like the whole, yeah, dude, I was, I was talking to PJ Jacobson. You know what I mean? He said this, oh, Bobby Fong. Oh, and I'm like, really? He's like, oh yeah, dude, I, I get the inside scoop. I get the inside scoop. Oh, I love it. I love it. A lot of happenings on the weekend. Obviously we were at Jersey and started the NFL season and your uh, crooked team, um, they sign a, a convict. So that was cool. Like you got to be pretty stoked on that. Whoa, like you, whoa, a guy that just a, uh, a lawsuit no, against good. a lawsuit against someone is far from being a convict. What are you talking whatever, about? Whatever. Whatever. You just, know what I mean? Look, at how the do end you, of the, how do you why would you even be a Patriot fan? I don't understand. All right, let's talk racing cuz I'm over this whole thing and with your bow and arrow and your brother and I actually not your brother. I love your brother, but well, Anyhow, where do you want to start? Where do you want to start? I'm just starting in super bike and we're starting with Garrett Gerloff coming out right off the bat on race one. And literally I think right of the year for Garrett, I know we, we could go back and look at Laguna Seca being his first win as right of the year as well. But I think that this was a race where uh, he got off the line. Um, he fought for the race the whole time. Uh, he went head to head with Cameron Bobier. And when you look at a head to head race, I'm talking at Laguna he was able to get by early and kind of get away from uh, Tony Elias and 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 Cameron Bobier in the sense that those two kind of got mixed up in a battle. Garrett Gerlach was out running extremely fast laps at Laguna and goes on and wins. But this one, this one, you know, Jersey's a little bull ring to me, and I think that Garrett was quick all weekend long, practice qualifying, obviously, uh, and then in the race, I just thought he rode so superb that first day uh, to beat Cameron Bobier. By 1.7 seconds, J.D. Beach was third. Tony Elias, insane fourth place, 25 seconds behind the winner. We'll talk about that probably on our podcast next week when we do our Moto America only one. But Matthew Skultz ends up fifth. Lewis Heron, Gagne, Wyman, and David Anthony round out the top 10. The second day, Greg, uh, you know, we had we had Bobier winning. Unfortunately, in the morning, Garrett Gerloff had a big accident and uh, wasn't able to participate in the races. But it was really a Yamaha weekend with Beach finishing second. Skoltz, Elias again, fourth, this time 11 seconds back. So they did make some improvements. Jake Lewis, Wyman Heron, Gagne, and Dave Anthony with Cam Peterson rounding out your top 10. The takeaway, I think, has got to be the shakeup in the points in the championship, Gerloff showing speed, and, and then unfortunately having an accident. 
Yeah, the, the shakeup is, of course, that now we had 35 points uh, Tony Elias had on Cameron Bobier when we went into the weekend. Now it's down to 16. For Garrett Gerloff, he got injured. High side crash. You saw the crash, Jason. I thought it was a yeah. little bit of a weird one, didn't you? Or it is, Greg. I have you done many laps around there? Have you have you I have you yeah, ridden yeah, that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, I've done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have ri- never raced it, but I've ridden around there plenty of times. Okay. Star, so you know how Star, the track kind of goes goes away from you there. Yeah, yeah. Star School. With I think my Dad. Remember, my dad came out for Star. That's School? right. That's right. I do remember. Yep. Yep. Okay. So you know how the track kind of goes away from you a little bit, and I think that what ends up happening is. Especially in today's day and age, we can ride these bikes a little bit on the electronics. And I mean, let's let's face it, Garrett is um, riding a, a very high wave of confidence. You know, the thing I like about Garrett is when you see him on the grid, he's very relaxed. He's got that that very infectious smile, and he doesn't he doesn't look stressed. He looks he really looks like he's enjoying his racing and enjoying his riding. And that morning that he fell off, I was out there watching the session, and I forget what the reason was for Gita, but I I I, I went with about. When the rate when it was red flagged, or right before the red flag, I had started headed back towards uh, uh, the the booth. I, I think I was going to go drop some stuff up up in the booth. And when I came up in the booth, I was like, "Hey, what's the red flag for?" And they're like, "Oh, it's Garrett." And I never really saw the accident. But when when the track goes away from you, there it kind of high sided him off the inside. And the worst part is all that energy that he landed with. His head was the last thing to touch, and he slammed the ground with his head. And I think that the concussion part of it was was the reason why he couldn't ride. Yeah, no, that it was the reason. And and one of the biggest things was when he came back to, you know, the pit area, he wasn't feeling well at all. So off to the hospital he went. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, for sure he's out. I just hope, I did get to see him after the races. He was in the garage, the Yamaha garages, as they were loading the trucks. And he said that he was feeling a lot better. And nothing other than his head, which obviously is a big thing. But, yep. I mean, there were no broken anything else. I don't think anything else was sore. And he had a smile on his face. So hopefully we're going to see him back in action. I didn't get into details with him, like say a Hunter Dunham crash from a couple of weeks ago. I know he had brain swelling and you know bleeding on the brain and he couldn't race this weekend because he still had, you know, and uh, the parts of his head were, in, you know, still inflamed or whatever, um, swollen. And so I didn't get into that detail with Garrett Gerloff. So hopefully he's going to be okay. But obviously there's only two races left, 50 points. So mathematically it takes him out of the championship which has got to jason it's yeah it's got to be a heartbreaker i mean when you're racing as good as you are right now i just can't even imagine you know i mean he's i reached out i i I did reach out to garrett and he answered me this morning greg and and he said that he's he's feeling better uh he needs a couple more days to be 100 percent. he said he's disappointed obviously that it happened uh he felt like he could have been, you know, had a great race and probably been a lot closer on the championship, but he's excited to get to Barber. So the main thing is, is that he's, he's healing, he's healed. He's obviously excited to get down for the final race of the year. Cause he's definitely been a big part of our championship this year of, of a guy that we've really seen step up. Well, and that was, that was really what I was going to ask you next. I mean, of, of Tony Elias, Cambobia, Gerloff, JD Beach, Heron, Skultz, Lewis, who is the standout for me? It's Garrett Gerloff, but there's no question agree. about it. Even though he's third in the championship, to me, he's the big standout in that in that class. Yeah, we've seen a lot of different emotions from him this year, from getting his first pole position and then actually turning that into three or four pole positions now. The disappointment at VIR and then the race wins that we've seen him put together. And I think that, uh, and he's done it with, with uh, when he's won these races, he's, he's stamped on it for sure. I mean, you could tell he was hungry at, at Jersey. And I think that that's what caught him out on Sunday morning, that confidence of, I mean, he sat... He, did, he wasn't like the first one out on Sunday morning. And I want to say his second flying lap, third flying lap, the guy went 20.3. I mean, just to lead the warm up, which was obviously very, very fast. So he well, was, that was, uh, that was, yeah, that was track record pace, honestly, Jay. Correct. So he went out, yep. did just those two laps, and then he sent himself to the moon afterward. Yep. And I was like, yeah, he, and he was late getting out of there. So, yeah. But the main thing is, is he's good and there's nothing broken. I think that now we've got a championship and you and I have over the, over the uh, course of the year, you know, and this is probably something that we'll cover a lot more next week. But I think that, you know, we, there's been times this year where we're like, well, championship's over. And uh, this is why I like having these full year points things. I've never been a big fan of, you know, showdowns and things like this only because, you know, we've ran a full season and anything can happen in racing. And now we've got a 16 point gap at the front. Uh, Yosh bikes, I, I think the big shocker for me at Jersey 
was just how far off the pace uh, the Yoshimura Suzuki's actually were. Um, they weren't even close all weekend long. And Tony, you could tell, was just grinding out the laps in practice, trying to come up with a solution. Um, and obviously, they made some gains, I think, Greg, the second day because he, he did essentially cut that distance down over half of what he was the day uh, on the first day. Um, but, man, you got to think that there's some – there's some worry over in the Suzuki camp going into that final round. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to be answered at Barber. You know, if the Suzuki, like that was the one thing. So what, what it's really seemed to me is, is that the Suzuki has now become like strictly a point and shoot type bike. It's not going around the corners as efficiently. It doesn't get back and forth as quickly as a Yamaha R1 does. So Jay, the question becomes now what's Barber going to do in terms of, we know that Barber's, been a good Suzuki track in the past, but is it anymore with the way Tony's got the bike set up? Now also you have to throw into the equation that Barber's got brand new asphalt. And I know I said it in the broadcast that Dunlop had sent Taylor Knapp down there to ride track day, Saturday, Sunday. And then on Monday they had the track all to themselves and they're going to do 10 lap stints on everything that they have because we know that new tracks eat up tires. They have the ability to. So I haven't gotten a word from Dunlop yet on what the, you know, what the word is. I've sent a text out to Tony Romo from Dunlop and I'm sure that he'll get back to me as soon as possible. But that's a whole nother thing that we could throw into this championship. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, the new tire that came out the fourth round of last year. Now what's going to happen? Who's going to have the tire underneath them? Are, are, you know, what are we going to do? I mean, I'm speculating. Okay. So let's just say that everything's fine. We'll just have a normal race. It's going to be great. But as Richard Stamboli told me, one of the things that smooth asphalt will do is really un like it'll it'll unhinge the front tire and any chatter that you might have, it amplifies on a smooth surface, not a rough surface. So, mm -hmm. if, you know, on the JD Beach side of things in that bike, he's going to be really yep. looking to see if they've solved their chatter problem or not, because the bumpier, the less the chatter shows up. So what I am saying is that on a smooth surface, any imperfections you have in the motorcycle can really be amplified. It's not like everybody gets on a smooth surface and all of a sudden it's got to be great. And everything's great. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's, you know, everybody goes, oh man, we got to ride great smooth tracks, but sometimes it can bring out other issues. I think that it was a nice little reprieve to see uh, a couple guys we haven't seen on the podium in a while. It was great to see JD Beach, you know, put two completely strong rides in. Matthew Skultz as well. I got to be honest, like during that second race, you you know, we've called these last three rounds and it's it's been pretty frustrating for, I think, Cameron Bobia. And I've, I've seen the frustration. We've seen it. I got to admit, there was a there was a point there where I thought, wow, is this really going to happen again? Is JD going to come snake a win away from Cameron Bobia as well? But at the end, you know, Cameron just proved a little too much at the end of the race there to, to you know, for JD. But man, that attack Yamaha was competitive and and I hope that they go to uh, the final round and and JD can can give them a fight. I think that the Yosh bikes are are uh, a little bit vulnerable right now only because there are so many Yamahas in the fold. Um, you know, so it'll be it's going to be interesting to see how that plans out next week. And it's going to be interesting Jay to see if Yosh like I don't know if they're going to have the ability normally on this East Coast swing that truck and trailer Stays in New Jersey Monday. They work on the bikes. And then it just drives down to Barber. So no real opportunity to, you know, to test unless they went to Dunlop for some reason. But there's no opportunity there that I know of. Um, I did get a text message while we were talking from Tony Romo. And he says it, it does look like that Dunlop will bring the hardest compound tire they have to, to the races with them. Yep. So one of the things that we had heard about Barber, Jay, was that, and we'll talk more about this in the podcast, was that. It's possibly a, a modified surface, meaning latex modified surface, which actually is a little bit easier on tires generally. But um, hey, they got all the information, so they know what they're doing over there. Let's move on to Super Sport because we have a lot to talk about in Super Sport. Race number one, it was PJ Jacobson, Bobby Fong, Sean Dillon Kelly, Richie Escalante, Nick McFadden, Xavier Zayat, uh, Braid Nort in seventh, back on a Yamaha, uh, Benjamin Smith, Corey Ventura, and Jason Aguilar, your top 10. PJ won by 0 0.046 of a second. That was a great race. And then we had PJ winning again, this time by 0 0.028 over Bobby Fong. And then we had Hayden Gillum in third, Bryce Prince and Josh Hayes. 
Richie Escalante, Braden Norton, Nick McFadden, Jason Aguilar, and Nolan Lampkin. Um, all right, Jay, the point situation is crazy good. Crazy good if you're a race fan. Not crazy good if you're PJ or if you're uh, Bobby Fong. It's down to 10 points in this championship. Now, net net, he went into the weekend 11 points ahead of Hayden Gillum. So now he's 10 to PJ. So net net, you're actually only talking about a one point loss. So it wasn't like the most dramatic weekend in terms of points loss, but it's who he lost it to a PJ Jacobson who's on fire. Well, yeah. And I think that the one point that you look at that is, that was gained uh, for PJ, it, it's not just about the one point that Bobby lost. It's the momentum that PJ is carrying right now. He's coming off of uh, basically three wins in his last five races. I believe he won the second race in, uh, it, uh, Sonoma. Then he follows it up with a couple podiums. You know, Greg, I think since Laguna Seca, PJ hasn't been off the podium. So he's racked up a number of points. Uh, the test that that team did after they went to, um, after they, after Utah, they went and tested, they were able to, to help PJ get a little bit more comfortable on the motorbike and, and I, it's really paid off. And now we're starting to see him shine. I think the race is really told two tales. The first race on the, uh, on Saturday, was uh, a big battle at the front and PJ just let things kind of sort themselves out. And unfortunately we lost Hayden Gillum in that first race to a crash in turn six while he was leading. And I think that PJ sat back and just let the race unfold. You know, these, these races are, you know, they're uh, the, the, the first day was 15 laps long and I'm sorry, 20 laps long. And he just let, let these guys, they were beating on each other pretty hard. And, PJ watched it. We've heard some of the comments he's made during the course of the year. And the second day was a day where he led from the front and Bobby Fong chased him and chased him and chased him. I still think that what Bobby did on the weekend was, was very good. He didn't, he never really looked, uh, you know, he got his, he got his 40 points and got out of, and got out of Jersey, which I think is a great job from Bobby. It gives him two more weeks to heal now going into Barber. And I think that he'll be really good down there. He did have a, he fell off the bike in what qualifying and it yep. was on the left side, which is where he's hurt. But I think he escaped with any more injuries than he had. So that was, that was pretty lucky. And I'm just, I can't say enough about Bobby Fong, Jason, how hard he's yep. riding injured. Like he is, if he wins this championship, he's going to really deserve it for PJ to win the championship. It's win out, right? Win out. Yep. And then Bobby Fong in second place, and then PJ would win on wins. So it, it's going to be great to see that. Now, we can't breeze over Super Sport in this podcast without talking about the little incident, Jason, that happened between Hayden Gillum and Sean Dillon Kelly on the M4X Star Suzuki. So to be honest with you, they were coming out of what? I don't even know what corner it was. A left hand corner. Five. Five. Out of yep. turn five. It looks like they got together. And Sean Dillon Kelly hit the deck. Now, to be completely honest, I've seen the replay 50 times. For me, I know video. I've been doing this a long time. I didn't actually see the contact. You know, like I, it was it was not conclusive. I couldn't say 100% if it happened. So I'm curious to find out what your take is because the aftermath of this incident has got a couple layers to it. One of them, of course, are these people that are getting on Hayden Gillum's case and basically calling him a dirty rider and that type of stuff. So I'm going to put you on the spot. What do you think about that part of the situation? Well, you know, again, this is a <laughs> you and I could do a podcast probably on this thing. I don't think we've seen this much controversy in our in our paddock and in quite a while, probably since Cameron and Tony were beating on each other a couple of years ago. Look, I'm all about close racing and I love it. I, I we, we want these guys to race close and we want that kind of stuff. I agree with you. There's n the video itself. I don't know if I can say that like there was anything malicious or dirty or or any of that. I think before I go further, I want everybody to know. Number one, I love Hayden Gillum. I think he's a good dude. Uh, the little bit that I've ever spoke to him, I think for years you and I thought we've we've watched this guy go around the the you know man in a van with a plan. We've seen him. We've seen him do it on his own. We've seen him uh, struggle. We've seen him um, do the best he can. Last year, he did great with uh, with Ridiculous Racing. I do not think he's a dirty rider. I don't even think that at all. I do think that Bobby likes to use a little bit of size to intimidate, maybe bully people. Uh, I know he's I know he gestures a lot while he's on the racetrack. I've actually had riders come up and tell me that. Um, 
But, you know, Greg, if I was to ask you who, and when you look at these 600 races over the course of the year and you say, who is the guy that's maybe trying to be the most intimidating? Who is the guy that we've seen make more contact with people? Who would you say? Yeah, I mean, from what I've heard and, you know, just around the paddock and what I've seen, it's Hayden. It is. But but this it, year, but this year, right, Jay? This yeah, year. this year. And and I don't think, and, 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 you know, this is such a weird subject for you and I because, you know, I can honestly say there's not really in the paddock any, there's not really anybody I dislike. And, and so we try to be as, we try to criticize in the correct way. And in this case, Hayden's made more contact with people this year than anybody else. That's just my opinion. If you go back to race one in Atlanta and you go forward, and I think that in, in Hayden has been the guy, and I've said it in the telecasts that he's, he's trying to go up there and bully some people around and letting them realize that it's, you got to go through me to get what you got. The problem is, is that Hayden's made some, some pretty crucial errors, uh, in Atlanta crashing, coming to the line and taking a, I think what was going to be a fourth or a fifth and turning it into a 10th crashing out of the race in race one in uh, VIR, uh, the big crash that we saw him have there when he was fourth behind the, the, the guys going on the front straight, uh, crashing out at Laguna. There's, crashing out at Jersey. There's, there's been a side this year of Hayden that maybe I haven't seen before. Uh, he's trying to be aggressive. He's trying to kind of be the guy that, that lets people know that you got to go through me. Um, and I don't know if it's backfired on him. I don't know. Uh, in this particular case, I look at Sean Dillon Kelly and I have to say that, I mean, I've said it all year. I haven't really seen the kid put a wheel wrong. It's hard to not kind of uh, I, I not take sides, but you got to believe there was some sort of contact made that maybe Sean Dillon Kelly wasn't ready for. And that's what put him on the ground. So that's why he was seething about this. Um, and so it's a hard situation. It's a hard call. Um, we understand that Hayden's been given three penalty points on this one more, and then he has to start in the back of the grid. I don't know if he's been warned throughout the year um, or not. I don't know. Um but I'm with you, Greg. I don't. There was not enough conclusive evidence in the video that makes me think that he did anything that was purely malicious. Yeah, me either. And he, I agree with you. I, lo- I love Hayden Gillum. I've spent probably a little bit more time with him, you know, than you have. And I'm a really big fan of him. But the thing that's weird to me is that there were years where I've seen him race where he doesn't get, you know, run into people. And I think I just he has told me in the past over the years that he has some anger issues. And that was all brought up about, you know, waving at people and getting upset about, you know, letting other people take him out of his game. What I do know is that he's not a dirty rider. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever point the finger and say he's a dirty rider. I think that for people who aren't on the motorcycle racing with him and you just watch from the outside in on a two dimensional screen and you don't get to see every single corner and every single move, It's not like we have onboards that you can sit there and make the judgment. But with that said, the one thing about the contact situation is, is that Jay, I don't know. I mean, there was a lot of expectation on Hayden. I put a lot on him before the arrival of Bobby Fong, the before the arrival of PJ Jacobson in the off season, all the conversation was about Hayden Gillum. It's his championship, his championship. I have no idea what ridiculous racing is going to do for 2020. Are they in? Are they out? There's been rumors to both. I don't know if Hayden's got a ride for next year. If he's, you know, in that position where, you know, maybe he gets a big bonus, Jason, you know, if he wins the championship, like crazy big bonus, maybe it's the team sticks around. Like there's a lot of things that could be riding on what he's doing. And that might be part of why we've seen a change. We all, we obviously know the disadvantage he has against some of the other riders like PJ that are smaller in stature, mm-hmm. right? We talked about it all last year, didn't we, against uh, J.D. Beach about how, oh, well, this is going to be a J.D. Beach track because it got along straight away. I-, I don't know. Yeah. And I'm not going to sit here and really try to analyze what's going on with Hayden Gillum. What I am going to say is it's a shame to see the mistakes that he's made this year for the championship from an entertainment standpoint. I like when riders are you know, rubbing elbows and they're close, but I definitely don't like see seeing people get knocked down and I have a hard time believing, Jason, that Hayden Gillum's intention in turn five to Sean Dillon Kelly was actually like knock him off the bike. I have a hard no. time believing that. I, I agree. Uh, the one thing that I have found this year that that some of the contact that's been made, not just with Hayden, but 
in general in the 600 super sport class. I'm not a big fan on the exit of corner contacts and down the straightaway rubbing and stuff that we've seen because it's to me, it's so easy to hook a handlebar. It's so easy to do that kind of stuff uh, when you're on straightaways and when you're, when you're put it, put it to you this way, when you, when you see somebody go up underneath somebody and on the exit of the corner, that person squares them up. If that guy that just got done passing you starts to run a little bit wide, what you don't need to do if you've got a head of steam on them is to go running past them with inches to spare in the sense that you've got to be cognizant that your knee, your uh, rear cowling, whatever the case could be, your handlebar, your elbow, whatever, has the potential of ripping the bars out of somebody's hands at speed under acceleration. If somebody's coming up underneath you in the middle of a corner or going into a corner, we saw Bobby Fong go up underneath PJ on the first day in turn 10, they got a little bit close and PJ stood the bike up and let Bobby go through that kind of stuff. To me, I can deal with a little bit more on corner entries. I haven't enjoyed some of the stuff this year where there's been rubbing going on down the straightaways and on the exit of these corners as much racing now has become, you know, I, I, I saw, and, and this is something we'll go to in a little bit. I saw Chris Orch said that, you know, road racing isn't a contact sport. I, I disagree with that to an extent not based off of it's a contact sport like football or something like that. But this year, Greg, more than anything, and we have covered this over and over in every series around the world, we are seeing more and more multiple bike incidents. And it's because the rules have got so close and the racing is so close around the world that guys vying for that same little piece of pavement, even though it's not a contact sport, there's going to be incidental contact, contact no matter what. And, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's a, a like a full blown, like let's everybody for themselves run into each other, but it has definitely become more of a contact sport. I think in the last two or three years than I've ever seen it. I would agree with you from the standpoint of you the, know? the current climate we live in. Let's make it fair for everybody. Let's, let's, let's level the playing field. Let's have motorcycle. You know, there's series, obviously, you know, Red Bull rookies cup where you're going like, Hey, let's get equal equipment. Let's get equal tires, right? We've changed now to no competition in tires. Everybody's got to have an equal shot at it. What do you expect? Yep. What do you expect when? Yep. And Greg, I sit there, I sit there and I watch these Moto3 races and I watch these World Super Sport races and, I, and I'm and i sitting there waiting for it because it's going to happen. Like I sit there and I freak out and, 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 you know, and I was lucky enough to race motorcycles for a number of years. But, but even in the 600 category right now, it has become so gnarly here in America. Our racing in 600 class, I'd put it up just about against anything else right now because it is that good. Um, and, and, I, and I love the people that, jump on PJ complaining about it. Like PJ Jacobson is, is a world caliber guy who's done amazing things. And the fact that he shows his displeasure and watching guys running into each other. And he said something after the first race, he's like, Hey, I don't want to go to the hospital. These guys are running into each other here and there and not making plans. That's his opinion. And I, and you got to respect it because he has been able to show that so far when he wins races or he does things, he's doing it without making a bunch of contact. And I don't think that talking about it being a contact sport, I would hope that nobody's going out there with the intentions of, of running into people, you know? Yeah. But, but um, with Hayden Gillum, I've heard it from PJ and I've heard it from Sean Dillon Kelly, where they know when they go out and race with Hayden, that they have said like, okay, fine. If this is what it's going to be, I'm not going to be intimidated by it. And so that, that yep. also though, adds a little bit of stress to the entire grid, I think, in super sport. Don't you? I, there's no question. And you know, Greg, I, I go back to one specific thing this year that I was, I remember and, and see if you do too, but I believe it was the first or second race at Road America. And Josh Hayes tried to stuff it up underneath Hayden Gillum in the middle of the chicane. And Hayden gave him a big hand gesture and like, what the hell was that type of thing? And it's like, well, that's kind of the precedent that you've set. I, I think that people, you know, if there's a door of opportunity there for you to do it, you've done it. And that I agree with, like, for me, what Josh did there, I looked at it and like, that creates gaps. That makes it a lot harder for you to catch up with the leaders when you do it in a spot like that. But Josh has been known to do things. Um, I mean, Josh will self-admit that he likes to make up time on the first couple of laps. That's just a, it's, it's, it's the way it, some people think, 
differently than others at the beginning or at the end of races or whatever. PJ, I've seen Tony and Cameron raced unbelievably tight this year and never touch. How about Sean Dillon Kelly at second race racing his own teammate, Bobby Fong at Pittsburgh raced him as hard as you like. And there wasn't really any contact. Mm -hmm. So there are ways of doing that, um, that, that, that I think, you know, could be done, but on the flip side of it, you know, going back, love Hayden. I feel that, that, uh, I feel bad that, that he's not really in the championship hunt anymore. Um, it was really coming down to a good three-way battle. He was at the front of the race on Saturday when he tipped off and, uh, I hope they, you know, these guys have a great, you know, a great finish to the year. I think on the, on the back note of this, Greg, I know there's a whole nother side of this story. Mm. Um, you know, after the race, uh, you know, Sean Dillon Kelly was fortunate enough. He got up, rode his bike back in and, you know, it was three or four laps still left in the race, uh, when this happened, or maybe a couple laps anyways. And, um, you know, there was a big altercation with Sean Dillon Kelly's dad, Pat Kelly, um, losing it just a little bit, probably a lot of passion, a lot of whatever, and throws a water bottle at Hayden Gillum as he comes into the pits and hits him in the head with water bottle. So now he's been banned for the next six events in Moto America. So that'll be Barber in the next five rounds next year. And, um, you know, just kind of a bit of a messy scene. Mm. I know, I know, I know how you feel about these kind of things. Yeah. Um, it, it really, it really just steams me. It steams me. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, I understand it's a passionate sport, but at the end of the day, it's professional motorcycle racing and it's a job. And whether it's your kid or your, your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whatever it is, it's that they're out there doing the job. And today Moto America came out with, or yesterday I should say September 10th, Moto, Moto America came out with, you know, a release that basically said, Hey, look, you know, this is what happened. And, and, you know, Pat Kelly's going to get a six race suspension. It was signed by Moto America that what they posted wasn't signed by the rider acknowledging it. So I don't know if there's going to be a protest of some sort, but you, you, you can't as a rider, be coming off the racetrack and then have to defend yourself against the paddock. I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous, you know? And, it, mm-hmm. and to me, that act of throwing a water bottle and hit him in the head. I mean, I would have hate to have seen Pat Kelly, who I don't know, by the way, you know, I, I know his kid, his kid is a phenomenal Sean Dillon Kelly. I'm a big fan of the way he handles himself, the way he has been handling himself after the Josh Hayes incident, where it, you know, left him with a scar probably for life on his chin you know what I mean? And obviously this incident getting knocked out of the points championship battle, you know, at the end of the year, I mean, there's a lot of stuff wrapped into it. And obviously for the M4 X star Suzuki team as well, but stuff happens on the racetrack. And when you come off the racetrack, if I'm, you know, Hayden Gillum, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've got to deal with the ramifications of my actions from the rider. But would you have to worry about crew, team owners, parents? It's ridiculous. And the fact that you get yelled at is one thing. Okay, because they're just words. But the violent act of throwing water and hit him in the head. What if what if there was a little kid, Jay, standing? I mean, there's a lot of what ifs, right? I understand that. But you're so enraged as a parent that you're gonna take action and throw a you know, a bottle full of water or half full, whatever it was, hit him in the head. He has a helmet on, but Hayes almost got in the in the crossfire, if you look at the video that was posted. And what if there was fans around there? And how does it reflect on Moto America if there are brand new fans standing around or people seeing it. And now how does it affect because it's out on social media. And so I think that Moto America did the right thing. I think the suspension fits the crime and I've, I feel bad for Sean Dillon Kelly that his dad's not going to be allowed at the racetrack. But to me, it's just absolutely insane, you know, that you can't get your emotions under control and that's where it just gets me aggravated. And Jay, you know, I've been around this game a long time. I've seen a lot of in- girlfriends, incidents. Yep. boyfriends, parents. Yeah, yeah. That they get all fired up about an incident that doesn't have anything to do with them. And there is a lot of stuff behind a lot of stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we know that. There's there's always stuff going on that we don't know about. But nonetheless, okay, you have a kid who's out there showing tremendous amounts of restraint, a lot of class, has a good head on his shoulders, and, you, and you're going to whip a water bottle at somebody and hit him in the head? Yep. I don't care if his helmet was on or not. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's like, dude. Yeah. So anyway, whatever. I, and then, and trust me, right now, Jason, I'm being calm. I know. Really I know. I, I, I've had this situation with you come up in the past, like way, way pre 
Ugh. pre-podcasts and things like 10 years ago type of stuff. But but listen, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, there's a part of me, there's a part of me, I, I like a little bit of argy bargy. I like a little bit of, you know, it's the same thing that we talked about with the Fanati case. Like, I feel that, I feel that in the old days, if uh, if the writer that had the brake lever pulled on and Monzi would have just gone up and punched Fanati in the face, I think that there's a lot of people that have gone like, yeah, that's great. That that's what he deserved. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. it's and there's a part of it that it's like I, I've heard the whole like, oh, you know, we're Pat Kelly. It's it's an assault. It's not an assault. It's a water bottle. Yes, it's an assault. But if he's throwing a hammer, that's assault to me. Okay, uh, throwing a water yeah. bottle. I get it. It doesn't look good. Nobody's nobody's happy about that. And I get all that. Um, you said something very key. I think that that I loved is that Sean Dylan Kelly has been amazing this year. Absolutely incredible. I I, th- I thought about this last night, Greg. I was sitting there and I was I was doing some some notes for the podcast. And you you realize that that Sean Dylan Kelly was forty five points back going into that race, I believe, is what he was. The kid was still in the championship hunt at seventeen years old, going to Barber. He still would have been eligible to maybe win the championship, possibly in his okay? rookie year. In his rookie year. Now, and this is a kid that neither of us really knew, um, other than we knew his name, but we never obviously got to see him really ride. And I want you to think about this: he was that close. He had a tip off, an accident at VIR that the team just weren't able to get the bike back together for before the start of the race on that Saturday. So that's a no point finish through no fault of his own at Sonoma. He gets kind of shoved off the racetrack, you know, the Josh Hayes incident that you just talked about. That's a no points finish. And then this weekend he's running third, whether he finishes third or fourth or wherever he could have finished. And I realize we're talking about, this is just racing, but he had really three non finishes that we could pretty easily say, you know, VIR was was his fault. He fell. They couldn't get the bike back together. That has more of a scheduling sure. impact, I think, more than an actual rider impact of him not being able to score points that day. But he's he's got three non point finishes, and the kid was still right there in the in the mix for this championship. And I think that that is what ate away. Maybe maybe some of that passion comes out there. I myself feel like if Sean Dylan Kelly was standing in pit lane when Hayden Gillum came in with his hands in the air, that would have sent a big enough message of like. You know, what, what was that? What did you do? Like, why did this happen? Um, rather than where it ended up getting to. So, you know, hopefully we go to, we go there to this race, this final race, the 600 race, and it's a killer, killer race. And everybody uh, walks away at the end of the year, remembering an unbelievable championship battle that we've got. That's going to be, you know, based off down there, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be everybody's game to win. So Going it's forward, be fun to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know, and it'll be for me. I, I've really enjoyed watching 600 Super Sport this year. The field itself, you and you, you know, I think this is actually something that you you said earlier in the year. the The field itself has gotten so much faster. I mean, a lot faster, and and so we've seen some guys do really well. Um, yeah, but anyways, we we were able to crown our first champion in Moto America to no one's real surprise, Greg, I don't think in uh, the Liquid Molly junior cup. Um, Drum roll, please. <laughs> exactly. Rocco Landers um, epitomizes everything that Moto America and, you know, Wayne Rainey and, and all the powers that be there at Moto America. Rocco Landers embodies all that. He's a young, he's a young man at 14 years old who, um, didn't just win this championship. I mean, he more or less dominated. Yeah. He had a couple of people that got close to him this year. He even lost fair and square one time, uh, at, at, <laughs> yeah, at Utah to Dallas Daniels. Um, but overall one of, 15, one of 15, by the way, right? Correct. Correct. Overall, this was the year that we'll remember that we'll be able to look back on hopefully in five years, 10 years, whatever from now and say, Hey, we got to see this kid race. Rocco Landers was the class of the field this year in, uh, in Moto America. A couple guys really stepped up that I enjoyed watching. Jackson Blackman this weekend. I feel that he's been around with us for three or four years now. I feel like Jackson Blackman, this was his coming out weekend. He jumped on that Kawasaki two or three rounds ago. He actually gave Rocco a run for his money all the way to the line on Saturday. Uh, Isaiah Davis, Cody Wyman, Jacob Stroud, Jagalov, Kamsuk, Hobbs, Rodeo, and and Benjamin Glotty rounded out the top 10 on the first day. The second day, Greg, it wasn't quite the way it was the first day. Jackson Blackman lost by by 0. Or 0.021 of a second the first day. The, the second day, though, Rocco split. 
He ends up winning by seven seconds over a tremendous battle for second between Jigalov, Almeida, Dominic Doyle, and Jackson Blackman. That rounded out your top five. Those guys came across the line, could have covered them with a blanket. Um, and then, and then back on through top 10, we got Isaiah Davis again. Uh, Teague Hobbs, Reese Burleson, and Jacob Stroud ends up 10th. What's your takeaway, Greg, on on the year so far with with this Liquid Molly Cup? I mean, it's really fun to watch Rocco emerge as a young man, you know, having to deal with the limelight and obviously the pressure. The, the thing that impresses me most about Rocco, and we've said it time and time again, is just the different ways he's done it. He's he's won a race in so many different ways, you know, from being dead last to plowing his way through the field, you know, whatever, all the adversity he's he's had, plus, you know, from pole to win. Um, in race two, he came through. He wasn't, he didn't set the fastest lap of the race in race number one. That set the grid. He was, I think, P4, I think, Jay, or yep. P5 or something like that. Yeah, he was like, P- yeah, you're exactly right. He was middle of second row. I, I thought middle there was something wrong with row. our graphic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But yet, still, they go to work. They find a solution to his problem. And if you look at best time from race one to race two, race two, he was one second a lap faster uh, than he was in the first day. And he was the only one in race two to do a 29, actually, in race trim. I think he was the only one to do a 29 period. I, I mean, agree with talking, you. Yeah. Yep. Jay, you're talking 29.6 on a junior cup bike That's and insane. super sport was doing 22s as the fastest. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's it, it, to me, what he's done is impressive. Now what happens with Rocco J this is, this is the question. He, he said he's going to Europe. He's going to try out for the Red Bull rookies cup. I mean, there's, you know, the, the European talent cup is like, he was telling me they're, what Moto Three? He said they're stock Honda Moto Three bikes, which I don't know what a stock Moto Three bike exactly would be versus a built-up Moto Three bike. But I think we're going to lose Rocco Landers to Europe. If there's any races that don't conflict, he wants to come back and race in Junior Cup again because he's only 14. Next year he's only going to be 15. What are the rules? It's like basically if you are in the top five, I think two years in a row, then you're out of the class. Then yeah, there's really nowhere for Rocco to go. No, but he's got another year of eligibility is what I'm saying. Yep. Yep. You know what I mean? Until he turns 16 years old. So um, I hate to say this, but I'm going to miss him. And we'll be able to talk. I'm going to, we're going to interview him for our Moto America only podcast. That'll, that'll happen next week. Um, I have his number now. So that's great. He's a good kid, man. He's, he's a great kid. I really like him. I like his dad. His dad has, has been great this year. I've talked to his dad a number of times and, uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's been fun to watch him. I'm going to miss him too, but Greg, what he needed to get done over here, he's got done. He's, he needs to move on. He needs to go somewhere. He needs to go. Uh, I think he's going to do Red Bull rookies, I believe tryout. And then the European talent cup, I think kind of beckons as well as a possible opportunity. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen, but I think that, uh, that we've got a really fast American kid right now that deserves the opportunity to go over and do that stuff. Yeah, for sure. So the good news is uh, Jay is that, he he at least spent a year here and he's got some exposure here. There are, you know, American champions. Kenny Roberts Jr. comes to mind where he never really built a fan base here. And so, you know, he doesn't get the recognition that he once had. It was one of the benefits I think Nicky Hayden had. You know, he spent enough time in the States wowing us all with his riding ability. Then he goes on, wins the 2006 World Championship, and he had that solid base of people, road race fans here in the U.S. At least we got to spend some time with Rocco and... Now I'm invested in what the rest of his career is going to do. Without doubt. Without doubt. Moving forward, mm-hmm. let's talk about <laughs> another championship that was decided on the weekend. It was going to be the second race that that was actually the deciding factor. And, you know, you got to look at this guy again, Greg. And this is, you know, when we look at 1,000 Superstock or Stock 1,000, when we, when we look at this championship, it's a class that we have seen grow this year. We've got more almost kind of noted writers that have come in and, you know, wanted to showcase themselves on thousands. But again, when you look at it, Andrew Lee this year has been uh, nothing short of incredible. He's won every race since uh, I believe it's Utah. Won it, he, he, you know, he won at Sonoma. He, he, he won at uh, Laguna Seca, goes to Pittsburgh, wins at Pittsburgh, and then uh, comes to Jersey. And we kind of made a little bit of a joke. The, the first day uh, his bike was, geared so wrong and you know him and his crew had a joke about it and all that stuff as well because his bike was like redlining at start finish line and i'm thinking what is going on um but it didn't stop him i mean he ends up winning the race 
uh, on Sunday. And with it came the championship for Andrew Lee, second year in a row. And we'll talk a little bit more about his accolades um, that he's had over the last couple of years. It's a kid I'm super impressed with. Corey Alexander, amazing to see Corey back. Corey did three rounds this year, finished on the podium, all three of them. Stefano Mesa, uh, again, another kid all year long. He's been on the podium uh, with the exception of Pittsburgh where he got taken out. Um, Stefano's class hack. Frankie Babuska, great to see him. A lot of club racer from the East Coast. Um, Good to see him fourth. Ashton Yates, fifth. Miles Thornton, Felipe McLean, uh, Segura Heflin, and Roy Holster rounded out the top 10. Um, I think summing up the, the weekend, summing up the year, you could almost say the same thing about Andrew that we've said about Rocco uh, in this class. I don't, I don't think there's a question about it. I mean, the only hiccups were really, you know, a, a non-Moto America racing incident where he hurt himself. But you're talking yep. about nine rounds total. Six wins for Andrew Lee, including the last five races when he's back and healthy. And the thing that impresses me the most about this guy is that he just handles pressure. I mean, Corey, yep. I think, got off the line. Corey Alexander got off the line, what, maybe seventh or something, and just put on an absolute show. I mean, he was just making passes, doing impressive lap times. And we got up to Andrew. Andrew just responded. And the margin of victory yep. was only a tenth of a second. But it just never felt to me that Corey had a chance, even though he had so much speed to get up to Andrew Lee. I really enjoyed watching that race. And, you know, what Stefano Mesa was able to do this year, he finishes within one second of Andrew is great. You know, I, do they have a double header at the, at the, they do, they got a double header at Barber. And I think that to your point on all of that stuff, when I look at things and I look at this year, the one defining moment to me is going to be with four corners to go at pit race. When Ashton Yates, who'd put on a tremendous charge, great to see Ashton on a thousand, he goes past Andrew and it's like, oh man, it's going to be hard for Andrew to pass back. It, he just went immediately right back at him going into the chicane, which is such a gnarly place to think about doing it protects his line in the last corner and wins that race at pit race. He wasn't going to be denied. Um, Andrew's one of these kids that I've been lucky enough to spend some time with and be around. And if you look at his track record, Greg, in the last two years, he's got two Moto America Superstock thousand championships. He's got a CVMA, which arguably out here in California, uh, I know AFM is great. He's won that championship as well, but our CVMA uh, championship is getting to be a joke. Now we have so many fast guys coming at that to that track weekend in week out major national players coming out there and racing andrew lee won that championship craig he's crashed one time this year he crashed one time last year he went over did the suzuka eight hour i mean i don't know as a resume back in the day this would be a kid that would immediately be on a super bike next year you wouldn't even question it and i just hope that th that he gets that opportunity to be able to do that uh, i agree with you it also shows how much talent sitting on the sideline with Corey alexander coming off the bench after a while, not, you know, racing a motorcycle and coming out and putting the fight to Andrew Lee. I think that the race would have definitely been a little different. I think it would have been back and forth between Alexander and Lee had Alexander gotten a little bit of a better start, but I think it's fantastic what we've seen out of Andrew Lee. And I can't wait to see what he has to do at Barber. All right, let's move on to Lickamali Junior Cup. Or, I'm sorry, Twins Cup. Lickamali Junior Cup. That I was thought we were year. going back in time for a second. No. But I was looking at Alex <laughs> Dumas thinking, hey, there's the Likumali Junior Cup National Champ from last year. And Dumas actually takes over the points lead uh, or extends his points lead, I guess. So Dumas ends up winning the race over Jackson Blackman, who was in the race on a Suzuki as well by three tenths of a second. We'll talk about that in a moment. But Curtis Murray in third, great podium for him. Drake Beecham in fourth, Michael Barnes in fifth on what looked to be an ailing Ducati. Never got the story after that. Chris Parrish, Madama. James, McDonald, and Lilligard, your top 10 in this one. So for Alex Dumas over his competition, now 21 points in the championship with one race to go, almost a full race. If he had gotten, what, 25, he would have won the championship, I think, right? Correct, because of wins at that point, right? Because of wins, yep, yep, yep. But uh, he, put on, he put on a clinic, and I thought that Dumas was actually going to run away with it, and he started to, and then Jackson Blackman tracked him down, and it made it a race. Loved it. Love seeing Jackson Blackman do well. Uh, it seems like he struggled a lot over the last couple of years. Not totally sure. I mean, and when I say that I'm not totally sure, I'm not totally sure because he's been on a Yamaha and we know in the Liquimale class the last couple of years, it's not been the bike to be on, but he's been getting beat by other Yamahas. And whatever the reason behind that is, it just seemed like things 
have started to click. And we're going to see a different Jackson Blackman now, I think, moving forward. Uh, I feel like he, you know, for him to be able to take it to Alex the way he did in this round um, in New Jersey was extremely impressive. Uh, he did great in the Liquid Molly as well. It's good to see Curtis Murray. I mean, you got to remember, there, there are guys that started this championship last year when Moto America announced the Twins Cup, guys like Curtis Murray, guys like our defending champion, Chris Parrish, um, and the Madamas, and, the, and, and some of these guys. Um, it's still great to be able to see them you know, be up on the podium with some of our young talent. And I think that the Twins Cup class next year is going to be loaded with some kids that might be moving out of Liquid Molly. I get a lot of murmurs and a lot of listenings to people that are saying they're going to go to the Twins Cup class. And um, – I don't know if it's a more affordable way of going, Greg. I think it's a nice step for young, young kids that maybe don't have that experience yet on a 600. Um, the, and it's not a bad step for guys to go. So I think next year this class is going to be stacked. Mm-hmm. And we'll definitely talk more about that stuff on our Moto America exclusive Correct. podcast a little bit later on. All right, Jay, let's shift gears and head off to World Superbike, shall we? Let's do and- it. Let's do it. Let's start off with the Superbike class. Of course, they had three races over the weekend. They were in uh, in where Portimao. Yep. And in Portugues. And of course, Johnny Ray wins over Chaz Davis 3.8 seconds. Vandemark Bautista in fourth. Haslam in fifth. Razgat Liaglu in sixth. Lowe's in seventh. Cortese, Melandre, and Rinaldi. In the Super Pole race, which is what? A little 10 lap affair. It was Ray over Batista, Lowe's in third, Razgat Lioglu in fourth, Haslam, Vandemark, Sykes, Cortese, Baz, and Chaz Davis in 10th. And then in that final long race, number two, it was boom, 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 Batista, one tenth of a second over Ray, Razgat Lioglu in third, Lowe's, Haslam, Baz, Vandemark dropping to seventh, uh, Melandry, Sykes, Cortese. So, Jason. Let's go ahead and, you know, I mean, obviously we're already, what, close to an hour into this podcast and we're just getting out talking about World Superbike, but a um, little bit of contact in race one between some teammates. And what'd, what'd you see, though? What'd you think? I didn't think much of it, to be honest. I like what Chaz had to say after the race where he said that, you know, he didn't run wide. He, he hit his apex. Um, when you watch it in slow-mo, and it's so hard to Monday quarterback this, but Chaz actually said something that could be a reflection on why Batista stood his bike upright and and uh, almost got into the back of Alex Lowe's. You know, he got taken out pretty hard at, at, at through no fault of his own. He got taken out pretty hard at turn, turn two there at Laguna Seca right off the start, uh, did Alvaro Batista. And so maybe when he sees a guy shoving it up underneath him, he wanted to give him a little bit of room. Uh, and Chaz kind of felt like Batista overreacted. The comment afterwards was with teammates like that, you know, who needs enemies from Batista to Chaz? <laughs> and I think it lit a little fire up underneath Chaz. So I didn't think it was that big a deal. Um, still, that said, Batista came back and fought all the way up to uh, to fourth place in that first one. Uh, second one, he kind of got shuffled back again in the Super Bowl race. And Johnny's, you know, when he gets out front, he gets that clear track. He's 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 you know, he's pretty good. And, um, obviously, uh, and I think that there were some, uh, there's a lot going on right now in world Superbike amongst teams, riders swapping seats. Uh, everybody's out there trying to get results. Um, and so there was some good racing even behind. And then in the last race, I mean, Batista did what he needed to do. He controlled the pace at the front. Uh, you know, I think that when you look at, I'm looking right now, I'm looking at, you know, even top speeds again, that the, the Ducati was pretty fast down that straightaway and Batista made it work. I was a little bit bummed for Chaz, you know, he comes off a win at Laguna, finished the second in the first race on Saturday. And then on Sunday, it sounds like just from his social media that they made some changes, Greg, that maybe weren't as good. And so Sunday he struggled a fair bit and it, I, I was a little bit bummed because I thought this is good for Chaz. He was only 3.8 back in the first race, uh, but they went the wrong way. It sounds like. Yeah, he said it just ended up being really difficult, you know, to race. When you look at this championship, though, Jay, let me cast your mind back a little bit. So let's say that we are, we're April 14th, Assen's over, right? And so yeah. far, we've seen Bautista win everything except one Super Bowl race, which they didn't even have. But he comes out and wins, what, one, two, three, so six, nine, 10, 11. He won 11 in a row. Yeah. And it looked like this. Cha- All right, so now... That was four races into it. Now we're after the break. They've raced. 
And all of a sudden, Jonathan Ray is 91 points ahead of Batista in this championship. Alex Lowe's now moves himself into third in the championship. But dude, get this. 241 points back in third place. Yeah. You know, and he's he's duking it out with his teammate Vandermark, who's only five points back. But anyway, the question is after Assen, would you have ever guessed by the time we're done and headed to Magna Core that Johnny Ray would have a 91 point lead in this championship? Did you ever think that was possible? No, no, absolutely not. Great. No. This is without question, without question, the biggest choke job or the biggest, whatever you want to call it. Um, that I've ever seen in any championship. I've never seen it. I've never seen somebody dominating the way Batista has dominated. I've never, ever seen this big of a collapse in anything. I can't even honestly say uh, in any sport, I think barring injury, of course. Okay. Um, yeah. Barring injury. I mean, this has just been a self-sabotaging year for Batista and, and to his credit, the guy won 11 races. He really did handle this, this Ducati. Well, um, we fought a lot at the beginning of the year with listeners about, you know, we're not giving him enough credit. We're not, we're not giving Batista the credit that he deserves. And I feel, I feel, and I felt like the Ducati's just on a little bit of a different level playing field. I mean, you watched, you watched it this week. It was, it was a joke. Did you see the onboard camera when he goes by Haslam and Sykes on the front straightaway? <laughs> did you see that? I sure did. I mean, oh, I sure did. It looked like a top fuel car going by a stock Corvette down the straight. It was a joke, and and it looked like it looked like you riding on a club day. You know what I mean? Uh, or a uh, yeah, yeah. I, you know what I mean? Like but, a track day. But I mean. but it, but honestly, um, all those people that were ready to me included, by the way, I, I I think it got to the point where I was finally like, well, yeah, okay. I don't even think Johnny can come come back from this, but but Johnny, in a in a way, yes, he did come back from this, but he needed a lot of help to do it. And Batista was more than accommodating on continuously throwing the bike down the road, and Johnny would go on and win the races. Um, so I mean, literally, it got to the point where the guy, if he just if he picks and chooses the races he can win, and just wins a few, and then finishes second and third a couple times. Um, this is ultimately what got Batista pretty much out of MotoGP is the inconsistency in results, the crashing, and and so on and so forth. And now rumor is that at Aragon he's going to get signed. You know that the coming out party with Honda is going to be there. Um, that he's going to go on to that to to that team next year. And I I don't know. I'd be a little bit concerned. He's on a bike that he can still win on, and now he's going to go jump on a bike that. Honda hasn't really even been in the championship really, Greg, for what, five years now? Six years? I mean Well, Honda's gonna introduce a new bike. I got yeah, it. That that yeah. that that we know. Yep. But then that comes with consequences too. It does. So now you're gonna sit what a year of development. So, you know, uh, but here's here's the thing. I think it's a I think it's two things. Okay. I think it's an epic choke job, like you're saying, hundred percent. But I also think that it's it's doubly the choke is the effort that Johnny and his Kawasaki team have really put in after they were getting, you know, their dicks knocked in yep. because, you know, if you look at those results and you go, okay, you know, going from the first, it's Bautista win, Johnny second, Bautista win, Johnny second, da, 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 all the way through the first three races of the year until you get to like Assen. And I think Johnny, what he, there was, well, there was no super pole race. It snowed. He, <laughs> it snowed. Yeah. But yeah. Batista won that race. Vandermark was second and, and Johnny Ray was third in that race. Then he comes out of Imola wins. There's a DNA. You know what I mean? Like, but it's like, they spent that time. Imola Jerez wasn't great for Ray in that while Batista was starting to give points away. But then all of a sudden, since Misano, after they tested, they started working on solutions. Johnny's been on the podcast talking about it, talking about it. Other than, you know, Super Bowl races, it's been win, 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 win second, win second. Yep. So, you know what I mean? It's, it's, I think it's a two pronged effect right now. Now the question becomes, okay, has Bautista got himself sorted out because he won the last race and Johnny Ray finished his second? Has he gotten it sorted out? Okay. So let's just say for argument's sake that all of a sudden now they go back to their magic ways of getting everything sorted that they had at the beginning of the year with a 91 point advantage, Jonathan Ray is not a guy who turns around and gives 91 points back, not in three race weekends. No no chance. You know what I mean? 
Well, yeah, I would agree with you on that. The next track they go to, I believe, is Magni Core in France. It's going to have yep. really fast straightaways. Uh, well, the track is kind of tied together with straightaways. So uh, um, I was there last year. It'll be interesting to see how the Ducati goes there. Um, I suspect that that Batista is going to be quick. I think that um, it when you look at even at Portimao, uh, there's the front straightaway there is gigantic. Uh, and Batista did a good enough job to keep close to those guys and then go buy them down the straights. I, I watched all three races last night, Greg. I was up till 2.30 in the morning. You know, it's a kind of kind of uh, homework I do for you for this podcast. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, you're so dedicated. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I didn't see Batista pass anybody on the brakes, not once. Every pass was down the straightaway. And Steve English, you know, kind of one of our fellow colleagues that calls the races over there, he was kind of saying, uh, you know, I think I think it was Steve anyways that said it, but he it was basically like, you know, Batista's getting back around to the point where he where he the part where he's really good, which is straight away. And and <laughs> take nothing away from him. He's amazing in the corners too, obviously. I didn't mean to like uh put any throw anybody under the bus, but but that's where the advantage is there for him. And um I think I think um come Magni Core, I feel that there's going to be some guys in there that are going to be willing to to beat some people up and bully them around a little bit and and try to get stuff up underneath them and some of the really slow technical technical stuff there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to watching those last three rounds of the year. They go all the I way to October 22nd too, or yeah. October 26th. I mean, so that'll be nice. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Greg, we watch World Super Sport as well. And uh, when you when you look at the Super Sport World Championship this year, it's really you know Cluzel is there. Uh, Kruenach is there. And then, of course, we've got uh, Kara Kasulo, who goes on and wins uh, wins the race in a, in a red flag interrupted event. It looked like uh, DeRosa on the MV Augusta had a bike maybe come to come apart or blow up. And he was very adamant about getting the flags out was DeRosa. So I thought that was pretty sporting of him to do that. Kara yeah. Kasulo wins over his teammate, um, Randy Krumenacher. I've really been impressed with the Kawasaki over there. Uh, Kawasaki of Lucas uh, Mayas only finishes three tenths back. Clazel there finishes one point nine back, I believe. Then we had Ayrton Badavini, a good run from him on the Pedertini Cowie also. So we're starting to see Kawasaki make a little bit of a dent in the Yamaha dominance over there. Pirolari sixth, um, Akubo ends up seventh. Jules Danilo is is eighth. Crescent and Pons end up. 10th um yeah, when I by watched the way that, that eighth that eighth place finish was on a honda cbr 600 rr can you imagine good run yeah they're still over there the landlord insurance honda team are still over there simon beckmaster's crew <laughs> and we've seen jules danilo also um in the moto gp paddock as well but you know when you when you look at it now greg and um you start you, you start looking at uh the points here i'm sorry you've probably got it pulled up but no i do have the points yeah yeah, it's, it's Kermit yeah, okay. only 10. He's only 10 ahead of Caracasulo. I mean, all, really, Jay, in that race in particular, though, the the, the Bardall guys, Caracasulo and Krumenacher, they they didn't like dominate the race from start to finish. But, man, they just find a way to pick their way through and then start to lead and set the pace. And I, it's it's very impressive to watch what these two riders have done. And in this championship, you know, Krumenacher in the last two rounds, so at Donington and Portimao, has lost, you know, um, what you're talking about five and seven points. So he's lost a good, you know, 10 points in this championship to, to, yep. To Caracasulo. So now all of a sudden with only three races left, because they only race once a weekend, it's getting pretty snug up top between those guys and Cluzel. Nah, you know, mathematically he's in it, uh, 48 points back, but still, it looks like it's just going to come down to teammates. So Jay, have you ever been in a you know championship fight with your teammate heading down to the end of the year? I can't can't remember. Uh, nope, have not, have not. But uh, th- those bikes, they looked like they had a little bit of pace too. Isaac Vinales, um, at the beginning of that race, was there with him, and he really couldn't go past them down the straightaway. He was trying to, he was trying to draft his way through. So you know, obviously they're on some strong equipment. Those two guys, uh, that that team's done an, a tremendous job for them. Uh, I'm familiar with the team that Cluzel rides for, um, you know, uh, the GMT 94 team, uh, the, 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 the main guy there, Christoph Gio is a good friend of mine. And, um, I know they built some pretty stout stuff too, but it just looked like those bikes had a little bit of pace and those guys are riding, you know, amazing. So they've got, they've got three rounds left to go in that championship. So it'll, 
you know, it's going to be really, I think, Greg, who can get in between the teammates, right? That's what it's going to boil down to. And both guys are very aggressive. So it, that, that could still go anywhere. How about a little uh, World Super Sport 300? In that one, you had a good race that came down to two riders. Gonzalez, who is your, I guess I guess you could say he's going to be the, the would-be champion at this point. He's got a 38-point lead over Daru, um, who actually won the race. And then Anna Carrasco finishing in third. So Jay, um, you, did, you, did you get a chance to, to check that race out? Oh yeah, I, I did. I, I did get to watch the the highlight package um, of that race, and uh, you know, Darun Gonzalez broke away. And I believe, I think you're, you're right. I think that if he'd have had a what was it, Greg? If he'd had a fifty point lead, I think he would have won the championship. So yeah, because they the, had two rounds left. Yep. And Daru's the only one I believe that I think I think Anna was still mathematically in it at the time. Um, but yeah, it was, it looked like it was a head, heady race between those two and all the field behind them. I mean, that 300 stuff is, it's pretty gnarly. It's so I, I, I mean, Carrasco, technically she's 47 points back. So yep. she's still in it. She's, so it's only three. It's Gonzalez through Carrasco. So, Anna I thought has done a great job carrying the number one plate and all the pressure. She's had some bad incidents this year, but she had notched up a race win and she has three other podiums. In the no. how many races have they had? Eight, I think, so far this season. So yeah. I think it's been she's a, done incredible. Yeah, for defending that number one plate, I think it's it's been awesome. Mm-hmm. It's been great, and it's it's uh, there's a young lady also that I believe Greg finished. I believe finished six in this race. Neela, um, uh, she I, apparently I think I think she went. To, I, I read something, Greg, where she went to the VR forty six uh, training camp. She was the first person or first. Uh, female that's been riding a 300 or 400 in this class uh that went to the vr46 camp and i believe she's the one that ended up seventh in this race on the weekend so yeah it's pretty cool i mean we're getting a lot of fast females in the world not just you know not just here and other places but even on the big world stage so it's 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 good greg this weekend we're headed to Mazzano and we're going to the marco simicelli circuit there in italy and i thought that before we went and and really looked at that i listened yes greg i did i listened to that <laughs> podcast what that you had that you had to do on your own uh-huh. uh and i know who garrett gerloff likes more which i i full props to him thank no, him please thank, you know we'll have to thank him when Go i see back him and listen to that garbage <laughs> but when you look back, I think that uh, you're briefing the Silverstone round, what what an incredible race for Alex Rins. I mean, there are just times when I just think, man, nobody can beat Marquez at a head to head, and we've seen it over and over again. And it's the Ducati thing, and and with the with what happened in Turn One, obviously between um, between Quattro, his first real mistake, I guess you could say. Uh, and, and taking out Dovey as well. Big crash for Dovey. I was real happy to see him get up. Oh, man, that but was gnarly, yeah. It was gnarly. Yeah, it was bad. But but when you look at it, I'm going to go back and I'm going to think about just the strategy, the the way that it looked like um, that Marquez just had this race again. It looked like he had this thing pinned and he was going to win it. And Rins pips him at the line. Vinales was, was coming. He had three bikes all crossed within a second of each other. But I really think that it was – I feel – it was it was probably one of the best Grand Prix of the year, just by the way it finishes at the line. I don't know if I said this in the other podcast, but I, honestly, the most impressive thing to me about the entire race was that Rins thought that the last lap of the race was the you know the second lap, last lap <laughs> second. of the race. You and know, then you want to say the word? Say the word, Greg. You can say the word here. You can say it. What was he it? thought? It, he thought it was it? the penultimate lap. He thought it was yeah, the penultimate there lap. There you go. That's there right. you yeah. go. <laughs> he thought it was that lap, but he kept yes. racing because we have seen people like coming and they kind of like chop the throttle and give up. But Rins was smart enough to go. Oh wait, a second. That's the white flag, and he kept it going because I get so many people that I was talking with, you know, that are like you know in the archery world or in like other people that I know that that watch MotoGP and cycling and stuff and they're like man Rins was like he looked so desperate on the second to last lap and I'm like yeah because he thought that was the race I mean he thought it was the last lap so he he started throwing the kitchen sink at it and he came up short Jay can you imagine you 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 do everything you can to try to beat Marquez and you're coming out of that last corner and Marquez drifts you wide, pushes you all the way out to the edge. And you go, oh, son of a. And you look up and you go, oh, <laughs> white flag, white flag. We're going for this yeah, again, they, bitches. Marquez not celebrating saved him, obviously, because he, then he realized where he was at. And um, and we've seen those kind of mistakes before. But how about 
how many times do you actually get to do like a, uh, a, a like a practice run? Like, okay, wait, outside didn't uh, work. So even on the last lap, yeah. he was he was probably going around going, okay, well that even though I thought I had just finished second, it didn't work. So let's think about what we're going to do the next time we get back to that spot. But incredible run. I think that Mizano is going to be a really good race. I think it'll be fun to watch this weekend. Um, you saw the whole thing where where Rossi rode basically from his ranch through Tavula and, yeah, and uh, yeah. all the way to the track this week already. So big build up there to to Mizano. And uh, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, again, uh, it's anybody's race, I think, at this track. Uh, the Yamahas look like they're coming on strong again. Suzuki just did really well. Hopefully, Dobie and all that is is healthy. Mm-hmm. I think the other th- other telling point of the weekend for me, uh, just real briefly, was Moto Two. Um, we've Mark Marquez, uh, Mark Marquez, Alex Marquez again was 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 doing very well in the race. He had Navarro uh, up his bum for the most part at the beginning, and they'd pulled away from everybody else. And then we saw Alex make really the first mistake he's made, um, like pretty much on his own. We've seen him get taken out uh this year a couple of times but uh when you when you look at where where he's at the the championship standings um he's 35 points up i believe still greg uh, on three different riders now augusta fernandez who actually won in england uh tom luthi and jorge navarro they're all 35 points back of alex marquez even though he's had a couple of incidents he's been riding remarkable and hopefully he can get back on track he has signed again with mark vds and He's got Sam Lowe's that's going to be his teammate next year. So that's going to be interesting to see uh, once Sam gets on that bike, if he could turn some things around for himself and and get a, like almost a fresh start with with arguably the best team in the paddock. Yep. And in Moto3, the championship is still as tight as you like it. I think it's like 14 points between De La Porta and Kinnett. Uh, uh, Arbolino is kind of in the mix. So obviously we're looking forward to that. Also, Jason, coming up, by the way, uh, at Mizano, it's going to be a doubleheader round for Moto E. So they get to, ah, yes. yeah. So I'm really looking forward to those races, especially I'm just going like fingers crossed for dry race. I just want to see those things right race in the dry. You know, I think they've only had what one dry race in the mix. Hey, you want it? You want yep. some stats though? Leading into, um, let's hear it. Leading into Mizano. Okay. This is one that I thought was interesting over the last 21 races. Mark Marquez has finished on the podium. And only once has that been in third, and that was Berno last season. So wow. he's all he's. Can you imagine that? Twenty-one podiums in a row, and only one of them's been a third. It dates back to last year. That's it's incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. Now here's yeah. another thing that that I that I know you know, but you might not be cognizant of. Okay, that win for Alex Rins at the British GP was was only the fourth victory for Suzuki since the introduction of the MotoGP class in two thousand and two. Wow. Is that shocking? Yeah, that is shocking. I thought it was more. I thought it was more as well. But yeah, since yeah. 2002, since they started that whole big, you know, four stroke era, only and four. And he's got two of them this year, right? So, he, yeah, exactly. And then, Vinales, and then Vinales has one, what, three years ago? Mm hmm. And, and I have um, to really think hard. Chris Vermeulen. Who has the what other? What do you think? One? Chris, Chris Vermeulen, I Vermeulen, think. Vermeulen, yes, and the rain in France. Yep. Nice pull, G Dub. Thank you, bro. Stat guy. I have no guy. idea why that came out. Yeah, but yeah, Chris Vermeulen. So yeah, I'm looking forward to to Mizano. There's so much wrapped around that. If if you get a chance to go to Mizano this weekend, I mean, with Rossi and all that kind of stuff, you got to go check it out for sure. All right, Jay, you want to move on to the last thing we're gonna do here? All right, that sound means that it's time for our quick shift segment presented by Arai. So for three generations, Arai has been making some of the world's best helmets. And of course, Arai helmets meets all safety standards, but they also pride themselves in a blend of engineering tech and human craftsmanship that makes an Arai helmet fit better and feel better, which also protects you better. Your head's worth the best. Go visit AraiAmericas.com for more information on tech, fit, and paint jobs. AraiAmericas.com because you owe it to you. Speaking of that, Jason, I don't know if you know this or not, but um, there's a bunch of American journalists that are in Japan right now, they got to visit Arai's corporate headquarters and ride some bikes. And in all the years I've been doing this, okay, 22 years I've been in the motorcycle industry doing TV, I have had no less than seven trips scheduled to go to Japan. Four of those, I actually had tickets purchased and I have never been. What? And I got a call. Yeah, I got a call from Jeff Wheel from Arai and he was like, hey man, you know, 
what do you think about the possibility of taking the podcast to a ride? You get to ride motorcycles around Japan. At that, 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 that. And we talked about this for an hour on what we would do with the podcast video wise. What did blah, blah, blah. And then he goes, oh, and by the way, it's during uh, New Jersey Motorsports Park. Weekend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there is that. Yeah, you dumb, that's, that's you too dumb bad. son of a bitch. I know it hurts. But anyway, in our, our quick shift segment <laughs> presented by Arai, we're going to rip off a couple questions. You'll hear this when time is up, which means Jason will immediately stop talking. That's a mm-hmm. lie, everybody. It is and a lie. Uh, so, yeah, and then that's it. We'll move on to the next topic. So, Jay, you actually mentioned it earlier in the podcast. After race one incident between Batista and, and Chaz Davis, Batista allegedly jokingly said, you know, with teammate like Chaz, I don't need any other enemies. And then he went on to explain the situation. Now, with Jay, with social media and inflammatory headlines that are always popping up everywhere, do you as a writer, you know, need to watch jokes like that? That's my question. No, no, I don't. I, no. Why do you care what anybody else thinks? Say what you want to say. If it, you know what the thing is, is you just got to be ready for the recourse coming back at you. And I, And, you know, I couldn't honestly remember. I couldn't really... At first, when I read it, I couldn't tell if he was kidding or not. Like, like, because that's kind of something that you would say. Kind of that's when you use that term, you kind of use it jokingly sometimes. But it sounded like it probably wasn't a joke because just by listening to what Chaz had to say, firing back at that, it was probably taken pretty serious within the team, you know, within the walls. So no, I look say what you want to say. At this day and age, everybody's open game. Unfortunately, our all our lives are way too public, and. Um, you just have you open yourself up for stuff like that, so it's just the way it is. Uh, MotoGP has adjusted its premier class start time to make room for the F1 race in Singapore. Greg, if they had uh, left the time on the schedule, there would have been a direct clash in start times this weekend at Mazzano. What do you think about it? Uh, well, I mean, I have two thoughts on that one. One is, hey, you're MotoGP. Who cares about F1? You've got to stand mm-hmm. on your own two feet, right? You've got to. But on the other hand, the reality is, you know, if you're hearing it from the fans in Europe, especially. Dorna, who's based in Spain, Formula One's popular there. It's obviously very popular in Italy. Eh, why not make some concessions? I think that sometimes race organizations, and I'm not going to point the finger at who, but think that like having a start time is like, as soon as you put it on a piece of paper, it's the way it has to be. And I think that MotoGP did the right thing. And they just said, look, we're just going to start practice and everything. We're just going to time shift everything a little bit earlier, one hour earlier, and give everyone a chance. So I guess, Jay, why take the chance if you're MotoGP, if you have a similar crowd to Formula One, why even bother taking the chance? Just time shift it. No big deal. What do you think? I don't think it's a big deal. I like what you said, though. MotoGP kind of stands on its own. And really, how many people really watch races live anymore? I, I don't. I mean, look, I, I TiVo everything. I'm, I, maybe I'm different, but I, I, I TiVo everything so I can watch it when I want to watch it. If you don't want to see the results, don't get on social media. I just crack up at people that that bitch about like, Oh, you know, spoiler alerts. Like when on race weekends, Greg, you know me, I come into the booth on Sundays and go, Greg, I don't know any of the results. So I don't want to know them. Don't tell me. And I've done pretty well at not being able to find out who wins. So yeah, I guess, I guess if you're in the mix and you're in Spain and things like that, but, uh, but who cares? Hey, old man, old man. It's it's not <laughs> yeah. TiVo. It's not TiVo anymore. It's called a uh, DVR, record- digital video recorder. Okay. What? Oh my God. You are. I still so got sad. video cassettes that I use. No, please. Listen, KTM. I don't. I'm just kidding. Kind KTM's of. gonna withdraw from Moto Two next withdrawal. KTM's gonna withdraw from Moto Two next year, concentrating on Moto Three. This leaves the Tech Three team in a bit of a pickle, or at least we thought it did. Um, the KTM Moto GP satellite team has been asked to move to Moto Three in 2020. Hervé Poncheral told Crash.net that it's better fit for his team. What do you think about that? Well. I th- I think that he's got to move into whatever class, you know, he has a chance of winning in or a chance of doing well in cuz that is not in MotoGP. Uh it's it's going to seem to me that right now with the exception of one guy and I know they're putting a lot of emphasis right now as well on Oliveira, but that team's in a bit of a turmoil right now. They got the guy that they thought was going to take him to the promised land, quit and has nothing for next year. We don't even know who the other rider is going to be yet. I don't think, unless you know something I don't, G Dub. So, Kacha them Poinchen. going to Mo. Uh, what's that? Kacha Poinchin. Yeah. At this point, Moto Three. Um, yeah, I think that class is so viciously competitive, though. But you know, I know you know Hervé a little bit, and 
yeah, I think he'll be up for the challenge and all that. So he yeah, will. And, and one of his comments, yeah. Jay, that he made was like, look, you know, the, the, the Moto3 bike is actually a prototype chassis like MotoGP is where obviously you have to fit a, you know, a street engine into a Moto2 chassis. So he thought it felt the program better, but Hervé is also very good on the political side of things. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how that whole year unfolds as KTM starts to really focus their energies get out of Moto2 and then split it between three and MotoGP because they do need a resource um, adjustment to yeah. in the MotoGP side of things. Yeah, All right, yeah, no well, this weekend, obviously, let's go to the race calendar because this weekend, MotoGP is in Mazzano in the States. GNCC stops in Harpersville, New York for round 10 of 13. AMA Pro Hill Climb is in Millville, Minnesota. I am telling you, if you're around Millville, Minnesota, Twin Cities area, or even if you're over the border in Wisconsin, just shoot on up to watch a hill climb. They are phenomenal to watch. Hare and Hound is in Lovelock, Nevada. NHRA is in Reading, Pennsylvania. And if you're in Czech Republic, World Endurance, or Enduro, sorry, is there. Get out and watch some racing. We all need you to come out and watch some racing. Right, Jason? We do. Yeah, absolutely we do. And uh, I'm looking forward to Barber, to be honest. I'm looking forward to doing our podcast next week. I think that... Uh, that we'll talk Moto America. We'll build up the season finale. I'm going to get some predictions from you, so you better be ready for me to put you on the spot. Oh boy, oh boy! I don't know if I can do that. Plus, we're going to have our other podcast. Might be a short one, the second one, but we'll talk about MotoGP and what happened over this weekend from Mizano as well. All right, closing thoughts from you, Jason. Well, thank all the fans from New Jersey for coming out. Looked like we had a pretty full house. Uh, looking forward to the final race of the year. Seems like it's gone by too fast. Thanks for all your hard work as usual, G Dub. 